To begin with, may I be, if I might, I'll start with the question itself. It's a conversation, but perhaps Sadhguru can look at this issue. An issue which is concerning me and uh, I'm sure many of us. The growing desecularization of Indian society, by which I mean the growing presence of religiosity in the public sphere. As I say this, I'm aware that Sadhguru, I read the book, Inner Engineering, makes a very fine distinction. He himself is critical of uh, blind religious practice, uh, just as I think he's also critical of blind science. Uh, he, he draws an equidistance between the two, and I think his realm is that of spirituality and inner development, which is what in, inner, or inner fulfillment, which is what inner engineering, he'll, he'll speak about that. But my question to kick off this discussion is, is this a cause for concern because it seems to sabotage the long-held value of secularism in our country, in our constitution, the growing presence of religiosity in the public sphere, where religion should be a private affair, it's become a public affair. The growing market paradigm of religion and religious gurus and yogis, uh, this whole God-mongering, and the way privatized. Uh, I mean, you know, religion is not privatized. Religion should be public. Everything else is privatized around us. And religion seems to be going, coming to the forefront in the public realm. And therefore the question is, the threat to Indian secularism, the deviation from our constitutional assurance, <coughs> the growing division of fractions that it's creating in society, and therefore the growing communalization, both of the right and of the other varieties that we are seeing. I don't think India is any more religious than it was in the past. It is just that uh, I think the media <laughs> is uh, beginning to uh, come to terms with reality. People have lived with their ideas for too long, not with the reality of human existence. Religion is not a new thing on this planet. It is just that in what form does it find expression? Let's look at it this way. Religion is an outcome of human longing to touch something beyond themselves, to touch a di dimension which is not physical in nature. This human longing cannot be put down because of fancy ideals and ethics and whatever else they make up. People, when they are poor, you can propagate these kind of things as if survival and utilitarian aspects of life are everything. But once they do well, it won't mean anything to them. They will naturally look for something. In what form they look at it? Is it dogmatic? Is it a genuine search? That is the only question. We must understand this. First of all, India is a godless land, has been for thousands of years. We have always been a land of seekers, never a land of believers. It's only now, because of various influences, we are becoming this way, that everybody wants to believe something. Let me tell you what I mean by this. See, when you believe something, you have made some authority into the truth. When you seek, Truth is the only authority for you. This has always been the fundamental ethos of this nation. You can believe something, you can disbelieve something, but still, you can still be a seeker. This is a land which never believed even when so-called uh, entities that we considered divine appeared. None of them could ever give us a commandment. We only had a debate. When Shiva came, his wife had a long debate with him. <laughs> when Krishna came, Arjuna had a very long debate with him, questions and questions and questions, because this is the nature of the human mind. Denying that and believing something that a certain authority has expressed or seems to have expressed, 
is a new phenomena in this country and you're seeing that in many different ways about thinking that suddenly India is no more secular. I think it is only a figment of a certain segment of the media which goes on on this. We don't know what is the <laughs> intent behind it. India is as secular as it can be. You just see all the people sitting here, they all believe different things <laughs> and they're all sitting together, no issue, nobody is going to stab anybody here. And this is a land where for thousands of years, in the same house, if there are five people, they're worshipping five different gods in the same family. And there never was a conflict because this is a land where we have always known that God is our making. Before. This is… this is something that most other cultures have forgotten, that God is our making because we do not know the nature of creation, because we are quite clueless about where this cosmos begins and where it ends and how it happens, we are looking for a source. A very simplistic thing would be, because we are human, we think a big man is sitting up there and doing it. This is a very simplistic approach. But this is a nation offered every kind of possibility and above all, all the deities that you see in this country were never seen as gods, they were seen as devas, that means they're exalted human beings. All the people, the iconic people worshipped in this country, whether you take Rama, Shiva, Krishna, these are all men who walked this geography. They did not land from somewhere. They walked this geography, they lived human lives, they had their own children, they had the entire works families and uh, kingdoms to rule and many, many things. They had their share of problems. Only reason why they're worshipped is no matter what kind of hardship came to them, they remained unmoved, something within them did not succumb to the external challenges that they faced. That is the only quality that is being worshipped and it should be worshipped because what life throws at us is not our choice. What we make out of it is our choice. Thank you. I must, in spite of the ovation, say that to be popular may not be always to be right. <laughs> Romanticizing religion the way you have done uh, does, go, goes against the grain of the facts on the ground. The fact of the matter is, religion, both in this country and elsewhere in the world, has been responsible for far more deaths than any other activity of human being has been. Definitely. I'm not disagreeing the fact with that. Is no, you're, that you're not making the distinction between seeking and believing. No, we'll come to that. I, uh, uh, let no, me no, say no, my no. piece. You cannot come to that later. You have to look at it now because… No, no, no. I will choose to… <laughs> no, no, I will choose to tackle it when I choose to tackle it. No, no, I, I, I won't not tackle it now. I'm as a follower. I'm no, no. here as a debate. I'm All right. here in a conversation. You have asked me a question. Let me complete it. I have not asked you a question. I've you already something. asked. No, I have not asked you a question. I've oh. said, I've made a statement that religion has been responsible for far more deaths than any other human activity. I have also… I am also saying that you are happily confusing myth and history and talking about Rama and Krishna walking the earth. Now, it's I didn't say earth, I said whether this is history or myth. <laughs> Shiva having a conversation with his wife and somebody having a conversation with somebody, you can't confuse history and myth and wade into all of this and run a, a logical argument. Mm -hmm. I know you are you are not for logic. At least you, you don't think logic is the end all of all our, all discussion. At least from the book, which I I respect that point of view. Uh, science is not the end. It is for science to discover the beginning of the cosmos and the end of the cosmos. <laughs> science is in a process of seeking, of becoming. Religion has become, unfortunately, a certitude, a terrible certitude, which is creating more division, more fraction, more I think. Uh, you know, dishonesty in life, uh, all around us. And that's become even more so in the current days. That's what I started out by saying. We are in, a, in an age of Godmen. We are in an age of so-called, uh, you know, uh, new age gurus, market gurus. Branding is a symptom. Look at all the branding of all the gurus that are going on. It's, it's ridiculously ostentatious and market friendly. 
So I, I'm sorry, but I, 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 I no, hope no. you don't get offended. You are, you are giving uh, your opinion about everybody in the universe without knowing a thing about them. Yeah, but that's not your monopoly. <laughs> That is not your monopoly. I am not here to. I am not here to, not here to pass a judgment on you or anybody else. No, because you said that but, about me. I'm saying. You're but you are. You are saying uh, these are market forces. These are god men. Whoever, whoever in this country called himself a god man, only the goddamn journalists are doing this all the time. Sure. So sure. <laughs> I am not exempting my persona as a journalist. Does not no, no, who, me. Have you seen one person who said, I am a God man? Of course, you are saying that. In your book, you are saying what, that. What I am saying? That you I'm are saying, I will do this, I have magic, I create all these things, I no, touched no, and no. created vibrations, I created power <laughs> there. You are I, talking like uh, a magician. I think this Towards is. the last pages of you, please reread your book. Oh, I, I think, uh, I think you need to little educate yourself about English language then. <laughs> How did I, how did I make a mistake? You're making up things. Sorry? Say, please, you're making up things. If you do not understand mm -hmm. the way the book is written, you will need ten readings to get it. Okay. No, I don't intend reading it more than once, but I have read it once. If this is the with, conclusion with you made, you, obviously you didn't get it. No, no, you, in the, towards the end of the book, you are talking about the need for more and more temples. You are talking about how you created vibrations in one temple in the US and, and made it, uh, you know, godly in that sense. You're not using... The but that's even more dangerous in my view. You know, somebody who calls himself a godman can be dismissed offhand. Okay. Uh, but, but you, while you raise very, very interesting discussions on the need for limits to logic, the need for limits to science, uh, towards the end you are lapsing into total blind leap of faith. In the beginning of the book you start by saying, don't take anything at face value, question everything, interrogate everything, Guruji. And you, you say that in the beginning of the book. You say, don't take even what I'm saying at face value. Towards the end you say, if you don't have a leap of faith, a leap of trust, I cannot guide you in the garden of wilderness. So, it is a book of self-contradiction in that sense. All right. Abhi, can, can I have Please. a few minutes? Please. <clears throat> Let's understand this. When human beings were just walking on the ground, if a man, first man, came on a bicycle, most people wouldn't believe it. They, th they would think it is something absurd or illogical or <laughs> magical. It would take a lot of convincing before people who are stuck in their own logic understand there is a way to ride on two wheels. I'm not even talking about an airplane, I'm talking about a bicycle. So all those people who denied the bicycle, at that moment they all thought they were logically correct, like you. I don't understand it but please carry yes. on. Yes, I, I understand lot of things are not understood. <clears throat> yes, unless they're understood, because, they're not uh, understood. Uh, because the way you're going at it, <laughs> whatever this leap of faith business you're talking about, there is no question of faith here. We are talking about a dimension beyond your present level of perception and understanding. Any human being who thinks what I do not know cannot exist is wearing the crown of ignorance. The most fundamental aspect of human intelligence, if it has to flower, is to constantly be able to see things that you do not know, things that you do not perceive exist all the time. This has been the exploration of science, this has been the exploration of every spiritual being. If you do not understand the difference between crude logic which binds you down, and the logic which evolves you into a different dimension of existence, that's a… that is what we're trying to change. That is what we're bring… We're trying to touch people with, that they do not have to limit themselves to their present dimension of logic and intelligence. There is a way to transcend this, there is a way to touch other dimensions of life. You thinking anything that you don't understand cannot exist. It's <laughs> well, now that you've told me what I'm thinking, let me say what I think. 
what I think is not exactly what you are saying, I'm thinking. No, from what you said, <laughs> otherwise I'm not delving so into there's your an understanding problem there as well. Let me explain what I meant or what I, what I think many people here also know what I meant. The simple fact is, science is never a certitude. Science is… theory of science is always based on falsif falsifiability. Falsifiability is the basis of science. Religion and spirituality may, may not be spirituality so much. Religion you certainly… You better make the distinction. <laughs> you must make the distinction. Yes. I'm making the <laughs> distinction. I am suggesting that you do make the distinction in some parts of what you're writing, but you, you tend to oversee the distinction and that to me becomes very dangerous, particularly in the times that we live in, because the dominance of religion in public affairs, in the public sphere, is creating more divisions and unity. That's very obvious before us, the kind of tensions that we in society. I don't think it is true that this was always the case. I think it's become more acute, at least in my lifetime of the last 30, 40 years, I can see there's been a progression for the worse. So either I'm seeing it with jaundiced eyes, deliberately, perversely, I don't see why I should do that, or there is a real problem there. See, people have always been religious, all right? But religion as it was propagated here was never an absolute, there's never only a debate. But for every kind of mind, for every kind of intellect, there is an option to choose. It is very unrealistic to expect everybody to have a certain type of intellect, it will not work. So for every type of person there are different kinds of forms and formats to pursue. And very clearly, <laughs> very, very clearly, in every village they have a different god or a goddess. What is it that I should… people write it on their forehead that we made it up? They're telling you this is our goddess, this is only for our village. This means what? They made it and they revere it because they need some point to hold their emotion and to look up to something. And this is not an unknown thing and they don't have any problem going elsewhere and elsewhere. So that type of religion has been there. But first of all, we must understand this. This has been a land of seeking. Ah, maybe confused and colorful kind of seeking because this is how human beings are. Making and putting a label on all of them is a wrong way to look at human beings because human beings are in different state of uh, evolution. You have to respect where they are and see how to take them to the next place. The last part of the book which is bothering you is to take you to the next place. I absolutely agree with you that in the villages of India, people believe they see the religion as a way of life, they live it organically. The problem is that we have now a set of new age gurus. I'm not… actually you… I'm not… No, I, put you're me not in part that, it's okay. You're I, not I, part I'll of handle that. No, I, no, I want to say that <laughs> I don't see you as part of that. If I saw you as part of that, I would not have agreed to this conversation. Why? Honestly. Because I, I have contempt <laughs> for the others, I don't have contempt for you. That, that, that's well, why. I, I, but <laughs> let me also say in the same breath that while in the villages of India, they live their lives, religion is a way of life, None of these New Age gurus really is addressing that vast hinterland of India. They are all caught up in this whole marketized India. That is their constituency, that is their target, <laughs> that is a branding arena. And if you look at the language that is used, including Sadhguruji, your own book, maybe you're addressing that particular target. The examples are all about middle class, upper middle class, consumerist class. Because the I'm speaking in English language. Yes. <laughs> And, and you're addressing when I, that… When that I, I speak suppose. in Tamil, I speak a different language. I'm speaking English language, the book was published in United States, yeah. obviously I'm talking to a certain audience. Yeah. No, I have heard you in Tamil and… I, I don't think there is an understanding of the rural Indian who is very <laughs> commonsensical, who decides what religion role will play, what role religion will play in his life, will not be led by the nose and he is the one who changes governments in this country. Even if you stand on a religious platform, he votes for you or against you, depending on how well you perform. Therefore, the leading question is, do you at all believe that secularism should be the bedrock of the Indian constitution? It depends how you define that word. If it is about every human being or every citizen having the freedom to pursue what they want, 
that's secularism for me. Secularism does not mean everybody should become uh, antiseptic and they must do whatever a few intellectuals are talking about, okay? They're, sub they're substantially confused. So, about connecting to the rural people, you must understand seventy percent of my work is in rural India. And if I did not connect to them, <laughs> if I did not understand them, if they did not connect to me, it wouldn't be such a movement in Tamil Nadu and elsewhere. So, just making this kind of statements won't help. Let us look at it specific instead of making general stuff. Your concern right now is what… from what I see is, right now the concern seems to be the present central government. They seem to be… <laughs> it is, it is a concern yes. as well, as well. Yes, it's fine. But what I want to tell you is, of all the people on the planet, when I was in United States just after the election, I spoke for Trump. People said, Sadhguru, you? I said, see, this is it, you don't seem to understand. You are enjoying democracy, you don't seem to understand. Never before in the history of humanity, change of power ever happened without bloodshed, never. Even within a family, I'm telling you, change of power happens with some bleeding. For the first time, because of a democratic process, we are able to change power one hand to another without bloodshed. Do not underestimate the value of that. Once people elect somebody, just bow down to that person for the next four or five years, whatever the term, do everything possible. Yes, you can set up watchdogs to watch what they're doing, what they're not doing, but on the first day he's elected, people say he must be fired. What is this? Do you know what will happen? If you change power and then because somebody that you do not like got elected, you want to pull him down the next day, this will lead to war, tribal war, once again back to many centuries ago. So let's understand this. If we value democracy, once people elect somebody, bow down to that because we understand if we destroy the system as… there are thousand loopholes in democratic process, but if you destroy the system, what we will get is way worse than this. So I don't have problem with any government. Here there's a communist government, I'll bow down to it. There there's a BJP government, I'll bow down to it. In Tamil Nadu we have another kind of government, I'll bow down to it because this is people's will. This is not my fancy. Now, people who think that whatever, their opinions are bigger than people's will, just now you acknowledge the people of this country, however simple they are, they have the common sense to elect the right person, but at the same time you don't value the person who's been elected or the party that's been elected. What does it mean? It means I'm in a minority which doesn't agree with the majority. That is fine. That's very simple and that is the essence of democracy. That is fine. Democracy is not democracy unless no, no, it is you, defined you by cannot, minority, not by majority. You can always disagree. You Majoritarianism always disagree. is not democracy. The fact of minorities being able to state what they want, whether they're religious minorities, intellectual minorities, whatever minorities. No, no, that is the essence of is democracy. Different. So Donald Trump is may be elected in the United States, there are a whole lot of people who think that's disastrous. That doesn't mean they are going to start an armed revolution there. You're jumping to conclusion. Nobody is talking about any armed no, no, revolution No, they're all on there. the streets. They're, they're on the streets. So, so are people on the streets in Jallikattu and I saw you defending that eloquently on TV. Yes, of I course. saw you defending the, the, <laughs> the mayhem that went on on the Marina Beach eloquently on TV. So you have one standard here, another standard what there. What is one standard here? What is you it? said it's fine, people must be on the street. No, no. Please understand. Protesting a particular aspect or an issue is one thing, everybody has the right to do it. But just protesting the results of the election, you're crazy in your head. No, no, they are protesting they the are values pro that this no, man no, no. stands for. See, see, first people have elected him. Yeah, they have You elected are protesting him. the and result of president. an election. He what does it mean? So if you pro protest the result of an election, that means you're saying you don't want democracy no, unless no. you win. No, you're no. just a bad this loser. Is, this is populism. There's a difference between democracy and populism. What you are saying, Guruji, with due respect, is populism. The biggest achievements in art, science, math, philosophy, as you know better than I do, were achieved against the grain of the popular. When people said the earth was flat, everyone said no, the earth no, was no. flat, scientists said, no, it is not. People who said that were burnt at the stake. 
When people said the the sun goes round the earth, somebody said no, the earth goes round the sun. Those who said that no. were burnt at the stake. No, you're you're not listening to. After me. the Copernican revolution, people realized science. It takes science to prove all that. You know, you 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 can't justify it if people say the earth is flat. Let the earth be flat. Maya will not achieve that. You know. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Oh. I, I see you have been schooled in all the wrong schools. <laughs> no, no. I am I am happy. I am happy that I have been schooled in the right schools and I am No, no, if right Maya is… I person. never uttered the word Maya, you are uttering the word Maya <laughs> yeah. The right to interpret Maya is not yours. <laughs> now let me finish this. Yes. See, you protesting an issue is your right. But you protesting the results of an election means you are a bad loser and you are against the democratic process. What do you understand from this? No. If you win the election, no. I will protest. No. If I win, I celebrate. What is this? When people elect if Hitler to power, communists in Germany protested, many of them died. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed in the gas chambers. You should not protest. You should not protest fascism no. just because it's elected. What kind of theory is this? Okay, then uh, let's dismantle democracy and… No, you don't dismantle you democracy. You are the only winner. You Anybody protest. else wins, it can't be… You protest. Be. You have the right to protest. You have the right to write. You have the right to say it's wrong. You are in a minority you, you, until you are in a majority, you see. No, no, you can protest in terms of saying something, writing something, whatever. That's all. You… you can't say, pull him down tomorrow morning. Who said to pull him down People tomorrow People are morning? saying on the television, he must be fired tomorrow. No, no, that is some extremist fringe group. There are lunatic fringe groups everywhere, there must be some. But the, the, the women who turned out in large numbers in all capitals of the world, the largest ever street demonstration in the history of the globe, that's, not, that's for nothing. I hope you won't say like Donald Trump that these are all cooked up figures because he believes in post-truth. No, no, you know? see, this is what I… You, what I'm saying is, he is the last man that I would support. But I bow down to the principle of democracy because I know the consequence of challenging that. Certainly, certainly. I mean, on that there is no quarrel. I don't think we are saying we should not respect democratic verdicts. I have no quarrel verdict. on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, on that there is certainly no quarrel. It's, it is it, just that… It is, it is just that you have a set idea about things. Let me talk to you about this. You said the new age gurus. That means they're of this age. I want everybody, whether you're a journalist or a politician, or a religious person or a scientist, I want you to be contemporary, new age. I don't want you ancient people living here. Ancient people should be dead and buried. So if they are new age, I'm happy. I don't want ancient gurus here because one has to be relevant to the times, otherwise what's the point? If they… if they behave like ancient people, you will say they're archaic. If they respond to the modern society, you will say they're new age gurus. <laughs> what are they supposed to do? <laughs> no, no, that's not what I meant by new age gurus. What you mean, what everyone understands by new age gurus is this post-marketization, market-branded, corporatized gurus. That's what I mean by new age gurus. That means they're successful and you don't like it. They are financially hugely successful, financially hugely successful. They have big empires and they sow distrust and they sow confusion among the people, generally. See, let the people decide whether they're getting confused or they're getting clarity, why do you decide that? I'm not deciding that, I'm giving you my no, view of it. You are saying they're spreading confusion and this, that. If that is so, they wouldn't come? No, no, the people go… See, it, this, this is <laughs> coming… Mean, this is mean. coming from an ivory tower, an intellect which assumes it is sitting on top of a tower, everybody else is stupid and dumb, they are being confused but they're still flocking to that place, no. It's easier… You, you, it's no, easier no. for you to just call me a fool instead of going round no, and round no, no, circles. No, 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 I will. <laughs> but, but you know, that <laughs> no. doesn't… that doesn't I, deter me unfortunately. I am not here know? to abuse anybody, please. But why are we abusing common people? At one level you say you cannot underestimate their intelligence, but here you are saying… you are saying they're all fools, they will go to a place where they're being confused and misled and whatever. Maybe there is some value to it that you don't see. We have had religion in politics in this country from… I mean, Gandhi is the greatest example. Gandhi is a great man who held politics and he wove religion into it. He spoke about Ram Rajya. There were critics who criticized Gandhi. I'm not one of those. I think Gandhi was an exemplary kind of leader of this people. He had the masses with him. He defied the masses. 
very often. When the masters were out on the street, he said nothing doing. He went on fast. When India was uh, attaining independence, he was on fast. As, I mean, I don't have to narrate all this history. See, I am but not, I am this not is the not, one to… This is very different. What you are seeing here is a kind of insular, sectarian, majoritarian, fascistic almost propagation so of… Where religion. are you seeing these people? All, every day, all around us. Where? I don't see them. Where do you see them? You must open your eyes, you'll see them. <laughs> My the problem with sadhana is well. if you're closing your eyes, you might be able to see them, you know. No, no, I, see the thing is, we have assumed things about people. Instead of assuming things, why don't we meet the common people who gather there? What is it that they're getting from that assembly? Something of some value must be happening to them. They're not going on a free. The thing is, oh, they built empires. Where is the empire? Are their palaces built? No. Empires build boundary setup, no, they're breaking all barriers. They're having access to the entire world in one way or the other. Now, the thing is, if you spread, you will say you're building an empire. If you don't, you will say you are no good, all right? So I am telling you this, let's look at it this way. I am the last one to support all the spurious nonsense that happens in the name of religion, okay? Let me make this clear. But at the same time, taking a general judgment on everybody and saying, this is it, all of them are spurious, all of them are misleading people. No, many, many of them, I, I'll tell you one thing. About seven years ago, I was in the United States and uh, somebody told me, Sadhguru, every day about hundred thousand people are typing out the word spiritual on the net. Then I said, okay, type it out and see what comes. They typed out the word spiritual. The first thing that comes is a spa in Mexico. The next thing that comes out is a call girl in Northern California. When I saw this, I said, what's happening? India has been the gateway for spirituality forever. Everybody looked east for thousands of years. What has happened to us? Let us do something. So I thought <laughs> I had never met any spiritual leader till that moment seven years ago. I had never stayed stage with anybody, I've never been to any ashrams, I've largely visit… not visited most of the temples in the country. But I decided I will put them together. I made hundreds of phone calls and a few ashrams and places I visited for the first time. Uh, I did find many of them were completely innocent of integrity. It was… it was an eye-opener for me, I… I never thought people could be like this. But at the same time, I found many people who were doing a fabulous work among people, very quietly, without any publicity, very, very gently. In their areas, they're doing wonderful job. So I met both kinds of people and I tried to put them together on a one platform saying, this is a… this is not like you have to believe in this or that. You can believe, disbelieve, whatever. Just everybody who is working for the spiritual well-being of Indian citizens come together and offer this to the world on a… on a portal where people can choose. If you say spirituality, India should come up first, then let them choose where they want to go. For whatever reasons, some people had reservations and stuff. Some religious groups came and uh, you know, from death threats to all kinds of threats happened. Then I saw, if you're not interested, what's my problem? I have no such uh, problem. I said, okay, leave it there. But why I'm telling you this is, there are all kinds of people in every trade and in every sphere of life. There are very corrupt doctors, but there are many wonderful ones every day saving thousands of lives. There are wonderful journalists and there are horrible corrupt journalists. There are wonderful policemen and officers. There are very, very corrupt ones. There are wonderful politicians and very corrupt ones. Similarly, spiritual realm also has its share of everything. Thank you, I'm glad you said there are some wonderful journalists. <laughs> that's… that's very hard I didn't put you in that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't ask to be put in that, I didn't ask to be put in that. But what you are saying underlines or reinforces what I at least meant to say in the beginning, that religion should be a private affair, it should be a personal affair, it should not be part of the public uh, sphere. 
the moment religion becomes part of the public sphere, it becomes identity politics, as we have seen happening in this country. It becomes mobilizing people on the basis of religion. It becomes factionalism. It becomes majoritarianism and minoritarianism. No about it becomes that. extremism of the Hindutva variety and extremism of the Islamic fundamentalist variety and all other kinds of e e extremisms. We have not had it so acutely bad until the recent post-liberalization phase. And that has coincided with the rise of what I call the New Age gurus and this whole religiosity in the public sphere. That can't be a sure coincidence. I would say, knowing uh, at least a few people and the nature of their work, if the many, many gurus who are in the country were not there, there would be blood on the street. Or because they are there, there is blood no, on no, the street. No. Because if they were not there, there would be blood on the street. There has been blood on the street. There has… I am not saying there hasn't been. You need to understand this. For a thousand years we've been an occupied nation in many different forms and there has been violence on the basis of religion, there has been force. So these things are happening, unfortunate things, but they're happening. But in reality, there are much… When, in your opinion, did that occupa no, occupation no, no. begin? No, no, no. It's in an important question. In when did you think we became an occupied occupation? nation? Huh? When did you think, at what point in history did we become an occupied nation in your scheme <laughs> of history? I know what you're driving at. Uh, <laughs> we become occupied when something is taken by force. Uh, a natural… If you… you know, a natural meeting and mingling of cultures and things changing is different. But when things happen by force, that's called an occupation in definition. But I am telling you, not just in India, everywhere in the world, religious violence is much lower today than ever before. If you look back three centuries ago, what was happening and what's happening today, it is way little. It is just because of twenty-four-seven media channels. If ten people die in one corner of the country, the blood spills into our sitting rooms and bedrooms and everywhere. But thousand years ago, if thousand people died in another part of the country, we would sit here watching peacefully the sunset, not being bothered about what's happening there because we wouldn't know anyway. We would never know probably. Maybe we would know after a year. So the thing is, because of communication, it looks like a lot is happening, but let's acknowledge this. For the first time, I am telling you, twenty-first century for the first time, we as human beings are a lot more peaceful than any other century in the last twenty, twenty-five centuries. I think we were until a decade or two back. <laughs> you see, you can't compare what we are doing now with three hundred years and one thousand years. Okay. There has been progress, there has been modernism, there has been In science. In the last decade, People, you think there's much more violence? Civilizations hopefully evolve, they don't regress. But now we are… it looks like we are regressing. How In can the, you compare… In the last decade, let's take last decade. Yeah. Since 1950 till two th to 2000, how many of these communal and religious clashes have happened? And how many have happened since then, if you look at it, it is way less. All the numbers and statistics will tell you this. Well, 2002 wasn't exactly a peaceful time uh, it is particularly not. I, in see, Gujarat. See, nobody is uh, trying to give credibility to those events. These are horrible events. But you must understand this. We are addressing these issues only when it spills on the street. We must see this, the moment you hold something, when the moment you hold something that only you can be right, I am wrong, it's only a question of time before we clash, okay? My way is the only way if you hold this belief. When it is going to spill on the street, when blood is going to spill, is only a question of time. So we need to bring that down. You can do what the hell you want, I will do what the hell I want. I don't have to call you names, which I don't. You should not call me names. I certainly <laughs> won't <laughs> Because you may think you're doing very useful. I also know that I am doing something very, very useful. And there are millions of people who will acknowledge that it is super useful for them. If you think it's trash, it's unfortunate because to receive and to digest certain dimensions of life, you need a certain level of receptivity. 
You must understand this, going at everything intellectually is a very poor way of going at life because intellect is a knife. Tell me, would you choose to have a sharp intellect or a blunt one? What is your choice? Sorry? A sharp you, intellect, sharp, certainly, yeah. You would like a sharp one. So it's like a knife. Whatever you give the intellect, it will make a dissection of it and look at it. So if I really want to know you, should I dissect you? Mentally, yes, perhaps. I mean, if, it, if that's the way you will know me, I think it varies. I don't think everybody knows everyone else the same way. There's I'm no telling you, there is another way of knowing life. By sheer embrace, you can know life. Certainly. You don't have to dissect it. Certainly, yeah. So if you go at everything as a dissection, you, if I dissect you, I will know you, you have two kidneys and liver and whatever else and whatever else, but I will not know you. To know you, it needs inclusion. So if you go intellectually, Knowingly or unknowingly, you keep on dissecting everything. This is like you want to stitch something, but you… all you'll have is tatters. This is what the so-called intellectuals are doing, getting the world into tatters and they're thinking they're doing something fantastic. No, I think having a zombie-like piece, having a zombie-like fatalism… <laughs> do, I, do I look zombie-like? No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I'm saying having a zombie-like fatalism <laughs> which has been the curse of India for a long time. We are no. a fatalistic people, the qu that you should not no, question me, certain let things. Let me correct that. Can I correct that? Huh. This is the only land, please listen to me again. This is the only land on the planet where we have been told for thousands of years that your life is your karma, which means your life is your making. That yes. means nobody up there managing you. Absolutely. You say that in your book, you say man should be the master of his destiny, not in as many words, that then if you, if you take hold of your destiny, destiny takes, takes charge. You say that, I think. But the point is, in what you subsequently roll out, it doesn't give me charge of my life. <laughs> it, it's too prescriptive, it is too fatalistic, it leaves me no choice but to belong to a particular creed and a particular belief system. That's the problem. Belief and spirituality cannot exist together because the fundamental of belief is you assume things that you do not know. The fundamental of seeking is you have admitted that you do not know. I do not know is a tremendous possibility. If you deny this, is it because of your exaggerated belief or your intellect? Both ways people deny this. They deny risen up somewhere. But these are all things on this planet, expression of joy, love and peace happened only from a human being and some other creatures also. Dogs are loving, many other creatures are loving, but it never rained from up there, ever. This is a fact, all right? Using this fact, this sense of being peaceful and happy is not the end goal. Joy is a fundamental ambience that you need. If you want everything within you to unfold, particularly if human genius has to unfold, it's very, very important that you are in a pleasant state of experience. There is substantial medical and scientific evidence today which clearly shows you that only in pleasant states of experience, human intellect and genius will unfold. In unpleasant states of experience, sometimes in strife you do incredible things, but it won't last, it's just a momentary thing because of danger, because of being suppressed, because of being cornered, something may come out, but that's only a momentary flash. But if you want a continuous outflow from you, you must be in a pleasant state of experience. So happiness is not the goal to seek in heaven. Happiness is the fundamental ambience that is needed for you. If you want to enjoy your dinner tonight, you must be at least happy if not ecstatic. If you want to enjoy a walk on the beach, you must at least be happy. If you want to enjoy the few people that you live with, you must at least be happy. So let's understand happiness and joy and peacefulness as most fundamental requirements, basic ambience in our life. This is not the final goal. Um, it's well. Keep your desires alive, let them flow in you. This is something you have always stood for. I've also read or heard that desire is the root cause for unhappiness. <laughs> so, could you…
could you help me understand this better not desire and fulfilled desire and <laughs> <laughs> desire and fulfillment 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 of desire ask them is a source of much joy and pleasure in their life unfulfilled desire is misery or in other words desire does cause misery because no matter how many desires you have fulfilled the very nature of the desire is such one desire will always be unfulfilled because of that one unfulfilled desire people are miserable one million desires have been fulfilled but today there is one desire unfulfilled they are still unhappy they are not looking at those one million desires this one thing not fulfilled they are unhappy i did not say you must keep your desire alive do what you want you can't kill it if you have a this thing that i want to kill all my desire that is also a desire and it will remain always unfulfilled the monkey example <laughs> you get the monkey example in there uh, in the book you talk about the monkey example you know I imagine can you get monkey out of your mind and the man can only think about monkey that's another dimension of the mind but i'm saying that desire people wanting to give up desire that itself is a desire and it'll always remain an unfulfilled desire so i'm i'm correcting this saying it is not that i ever said you must keep your desires alive you can't kill it kill it and see let me see you do what you want you can't kill it people think oh i have given up all my desire i want only god what you are saying is i don't want pieces of creation i want the source of creation how is, this is super greedy or <laughs> it's how how do you, how how do you think that you given up desire now you want the very source of creation because small pieces of creation didn't settle you so where does this fine line between gr uh, desire and greed fall what i have is desire what you have is greed It's always a label that we put on somebody else. <laughs> What I have is a very reasonable desire. What you have is greed. That's how that word has come. <laughs> And thinking about inner engineering, Guruji, uh, can, would it be right to say that the mind is the most vulnerable machine in the body? Why is it vulnerable? It is the most fantastic thing. See. this is this desire and this greed is what, everything happens this is the fundamental life. thing that in many ways we are bringing about a change in people's way of looking at it it took millions of years of evolution to develop this much cerebral capability but today what is the source of people's misery every individuals everybody i don't know to what extent you are exposed to human misery every day i'm meeting thousands of people how many varieties of ways of suffering they've invented means unbelievable anything you give them they're capable of suffering so this human intelligence or the cerebral capability happened over millions of years of tremendous work i want you to imagine from an amoeba to someone like you or me right now how much work how much work has happened to bring it bring this to this level of capability and sensitivity sensitivity but now that is a problem because most people are in this state for every solution they have a problem okay <laughs> yes yes <laughs> for every solution they have a problem now this un, un this flowering of human intelligence is the biggest solution for everything but that is the only problem most people have right now what is it that they are suffering what happened 10 days ago they can still suffer yes what happened 10 years ago still suffer what may happen day after tomorrow you already suffer you are not suffering life you are suffering the two most significant faculties of being human a vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination this is what you are suffering you are not suffering life what is the most fantastic gift what sets us apart from every other creature on this planet that is what you're suffering or in other words you're suffering evolution you want to go back so people's idea of being peaceful is 
I think uh, Kerala is a dry state. Is it? Pearl. So those who can afford will get knocked out with whatever they drink here. What is it that you're trying to do? You're trying to dull the intelligence because the damn thing bothers you. It bothers you not because it's a problem, it bothers you because you've been given an instrument for which you have not bothered to read the user's manual. <laughs> Simply, do something and you think mind is the source of suffering, desire is the source of suffering, no. These are the most fantastic things that have happened to you. If you had come here like any other creature, stomach full, life settled. Once you come as a human being, stomach empty, only one problem. Stomach full, one hundred problems. These are not problems, these are possibilities that you are treating them as problems. Every possibility is a problem for those who don't realize the possibility. But human nature is such, you place him wherever you want. She will not be fulfilled, he wants something more. But if you look at this, what he wants is not more, he wants all. All is an inclusive state. But when you're in the path of more, you will be in conquest. You will be in this word called greed or simply continue shopping, whatever. <laughs> but if it became all, if your desire became for all, because you understand in installments you're trying to go towards infinity. You cannot count one, two, three, four, five and say infinite one day, it's never going to happen. You'll only become endless counting. If you sit down and look at… everybody must do this. You must sit down and look at the nature of your desire. You will see it is not for this object or that object. Whatever is given, you want the next one. Okay, right now, anyway you have the imagination, every damn thing that can be given to you is given. Let's say I made you the king or queen of this planet, will you be fulfilled, I'm asking. You will look at the rest of the solar system. If I give you the solar system, will you be fulfilled? You look at the galaxy. If I give you one galaxy, will you be fulfilled? You look at the other galaxies. This is the nature of human. It doesn't matter how, na how many idiotic philosophies and pacifist philosophies have been taught. Nobody has been able to quell the human longing. Not for one person has it worked. It works only when you're very sick, or too old for anything. Otherwise it doesn't work. When you're very ill, you'll say podum, podum, podum. But tomorrow morning little doing well, again, on <laughs> um, We are also witness to the youth of today. Uh, it has been seen gravitating towards alcohol or drug addictions as a result of their search for happiness or search for pleasure. How can you uh, like show them what real happiness is. How can this made? How can this be made into unadulterated bliss? It's like this. I've been looking at this. I was, I was in New York City with a very large group of people, and I asked them a simple question: How many people in New York City can sit through an evening peacefully without even a glass of wine? I'm putting wine as the lowest dose. Others, in New York City, people need various things. After much debate, they said five percent. I was in London, very prominent group of people, I asked the same question, what percentage of people in London can sit through the evening without even a glass of wine? They said less than one percent. In India, twenty-five years ago, thirty years ago, in a small town or a village, there will be five, ten people who drink. That too, they don't drink at home, they go somewhere hiding behind a tree somewhere. I know when we were growing up, people go and meet in the cremation ground to drink because nobody will come. And because spirits, you know, it goes well <laughs> So, <laughs> that's how it was. People will say, oh, that family, they're drunkards, you can't give your girls to that family, this kind of thing. Today, at least I don't know how it's here, in the north at least, if you don't serve alcohol, nobody will come to your wedding. They'll ask first, is there a cocktail party, otherwise we're not coming, okay? So, uh, it's gone thousand, ten thousand percent in a matter of twenty-five, thirty years. Why is this? People think it's because of marketing. No, the thing is this, human intellect is firing like never before. Never before in the history of humanity, so many people could think for themselves. 
For a long time your scripture, your priest, your pandit, your guru, somebody thought for you. Now too many people, a whole lot of people can think for themselves. They're thinking right, wrong, we don't have to make the judgment, but they're thinking. The problem with thinking is this, when you think, it has to be logically correct. See, why two people are arguing with each other is because both the people think they're logically correct. It is not that one person is arguing for logic, another person is arguing for illogic, no. Both of them always think they're logically correct, all right? Because the nature of the thought itself is such, the progression of thought itself is such, in some way at least within yourself it must be logically correct. So now you come to a place, unless something is logically correct, you cannot swallow it. So once this happens, Believe me, heavens will collapse. Oh, where are they? Wherever they are, they will collapse. Should I explore the heaven a little bit? <laughs> Is it safe for me? <laughs> uh, what is there in heaven? In the Hindu heaven, food is very good. <laughs> if you are a foodie, that's where you must go. In another heaven, there was those white gowned ladies floating in the clouds. You like that kind of ambience, you go there. In another heaven, you'll encounter virgin problems and stuff. If you like that, you go there. These are all different types of heavens which have lived in people's minds for a long time. These… these imaginations have kind of handled people's longing. They were always told, it doesn't matter, your life is bad here, when you go there, everything will be great, all your difficulties will be rewarded there. This was going on for a long time. Now because people are thinking logically, heavens are collapsing in their mind. Here they want to do it, everything, all right? Anyway, there you said rivers flow with wine. They want to do it right here now because heaven has collapsed in their mind. Believe me, in another twenty to thirty years, maximum fifty years time, all heavens will collapse largely, ninety percent of the heaven will collapse in people's minds. So when that happens, a large-scale movement towards chemicals will happen. For example, United States. Why I'm taking United States as an example is not because of uh, the new president, because it's the most affluent nation on the planet. Affluence means this, the first… see every human being is working towards their affluence in some way, or societies are working, nations are working. What is the intent? At the first stage you believe if affluence comes, you will have a choice of nourishment. At the second stage you believe if affluence comes, you will have a choice of lifestyle. So the most affluent nation which have the highest level of choice of nourishment and lifestyles, seventy percent of the American population is on prescription medication. That means to be healthful, you need chemicals. To be peaceful, you need chemicals. Marijuana is legal, at least in five states, I think. To be joyful, you need chemicals. If you want to have a taste of ecstasy, you need chemicals. Once you need chemicals for everything, let us say in the next fifty, sixty years, if the humanity moves in this direction, ninety percent of the humanity is on some kind of chemical, prescribed or otherwise, when this happens, what will happen is the next generation that we produce will be genetically less than who we are. This is a crime against humanity. One fundamental responsibility we have as a generation is, the next generation we produce must be at least one notch better than us. If they are less than us, we have failed as a generation and as human beings. This will happen unless you bring about a logically correct, scientifically verifiable spiritual process where people know how to take charge of their experience. If you… today I can show you millions of people, if they as much as close their eyes and say tears of ecstasy will flow. If you do not create this large scale, you will have a large scale movement towards alcohol and drugs. You cannot stop it because human longing to experience something more is not something that you can stop with morality or ethic or rules or uh, you know prohibitions, whatever you cannot stop it. Only by heightening the inner experience, the need will go away because your experience of who you are is better than anything you can get in the marketplace. I'm 
Look at me, my eyes, I'm always stoned. Never touched a substance in my life, but it's always like that. People have done some tests and they tell me that my blood is full of uh, melatonin all the time. <laughs> my pulse rate is like around forty, if I simply sit quietly. So when you're feeling so pleasant within yourself, why would you want to mess it with something from outside? This we have to bring to our youth, to our children. We have to bring, we have to make them understand the seat of human experiences within us. Experience of all kinds, joy and misery, pain and pleasure, agony and ecstasy is the source of it is within us. If you take charge of it, it's your choice. What is your experience? <laughs> uh, see, right now the way we are going, if all the 7.3 billion people use all the modern technology and become super industrious, this planet has just twelve to fifteen years. Fifty percent of the people are lazy, that is what is saving the world. <laughs> it's a, not the right way to go, human love, human intelligence, human sense should have saved the planet, but unfortunately human lethargy is saving the planet. But I'm not against the lazy because at least they're not harming anybody. <laughs> huh? I'm not saying it's good, but it is better than destructive activity. <laughs> Guruji, I've heard you're an avid biker. So no. I'd like to know which is going to be your next destination and why. <laughs> The next… Uh, this is… this bike thing is all overdone up and uh, you know, I, I see some of the magazines have written that I ride a Harley Davidson. I wouldn't want to be seen dead on a Harley Davidson. <laughs> I have more sense about motorcycles than that. That's not a bike, that's half a car. This is your favorite <laughs> bike. <laughs> <laughs> when I was riding, it was all the Czech bikes, the Javas and the SDs which we used it to the limit, I… I was just telling them, this particular road was my favorite. I started off at Goa and went to Kanyakumari and back again eleven times, up and down, <laughs> trekking through the mountains and all that. So, uh, next destination, because this is happening in September, I'm driving, not riding, maybe a segment I will ride. I'm driving from Leh, Ladakh down to Kanyakumari and back to New Delhi again. This is to campaign in sixteen states for the state of our rivers. On an average, all Indian rivers are depleting by eight percent per year. Most rivers that we have, which have been perennial for millions of years probably, will become seasonal rivers in a matter of another fifteen, twenty years' time. For example, Kaveri, for which two states are at war with each other, Two and a half to three months, it doesn't touch the ocean. Krishna doesn't touch the ocean for over four months. Like this we can go on, terrible statistics are there. The northern rivers are a different matter because they are ice-fed rivers, that's a global situation, you can't change that so simply. But all the southern rivers are forest-fed rivers. If we take appropriate action now, in the next ten, fifteen years, we can bring up the river at least ten to twenty percent from what it is now. We can… we… our children need not see rivers in a museum, they can see a genuine river. Being in Kerala with all this water, don't be fooled. The, you do one thing from Calicut, I'm sorry, Koli Kod, you fly to Delhi, look down, all along, it's brown desert except for a few green patches in here and there. I want all of you to look at it. Next time you fly, please look down and see our entire nation, we are converting it to a desert. When I say desert, what is the difference between desert and the fertile lands that we have is phenomenal amount of bioactivity on the surface, on the topsoil. But once you plow the land and leave it open to sunlight for over six months at a stretch, all the bioactivity sinks below twelve to eighteen inches. This means in another twenty-five years, what you see as soil today will become sand. This is a no-brainer, this doesn't take any great scientist to tell you this. Anybody 
who knows land knows this. And from the age of twelve to seventeen, every day, almost every day, at least the five weekdays, every uh, week, five days at least, I swam in Kaveri in Mysore. Today if I see the river, I, I feel like crying because it's around forty percent or less than what it used to be. This river will not be there in another fifty years time, it will be completely gone. Many tributaries, Kaveri has over seventy tributaries. Out of this, at least twenty of them are totally gone, they don't exist anymore. We don't even understand a river has tributaries. If you don't take care of the tributaries, there will be no river. So we want to spread a massive awareness about this, we are preparing a policy document which we want to present to the federal or the central government so that there is a river policy in the country. Right now all our river policies are about how best can we exploit it. That time is gone. How to regenerate these rivers, this is what we need to think about if we want to live a… leave a, a living India for our children. Because this is a land which is grown on rivers, this is a culture and a civilization that's evolved out of river banks. If we want to live a… Live, live, if you want to live a living India, not a dry dead India, it's very important we do this. So as a part of this, I drive… of course I enjoy driving across the country. It's not a crime to enjoy it. <laughs> do you watch movies, Guruji, as a small part of the world of cinema? There was I'd like to know. There was a time when I watched a lot of movies, but I must admit I have not watched too many Indian movies. I… because uh, we were traveling all the time in different states, so I did not take to any particular language. English was the thing, so we watched English movies. But now, nah, I would like to watch but time-wise three hours doesn't happen. What kind of movies used to interest you, like action, comedy? I think… I think I never looked at the content of the movie. I always looked at the quality of how it is done, the cinematography, the acting and stuff. For me the story, uh, whether it's comedy, this, that never mattered. For me the main thing is… See, my life is like this, I must tell you this. Right from my childhood, when I look at something, I know the first thing I see is the geometry of it. I don't see the colors, even if a human being is sitting, if I just look at you, first thing I see is the geometry of how you're sitting. This is what first I grasp, I will take a lot of time to grasp the other aspects, first thing is always geometry. If I see a human being, how they're sitting right now, I will tell them in the next ten, fifteen years, what ailments will they have, what problems will they have right now? Just looking at the geometry of their body, if they're in that pose, what will happen to them? In a way, the entire yogic system is just this, that getting your geometry in alignment with the larger geometry of the existence, so that your ability to perceive suddenly takes a huge leap, that because you're in symmetry with something, Suddenly you grasp things like you never imagined possible, like you never imagined possible. Today, modern constructional theories, uh, scientific theories are saying that the geometry or the fundamental design of an atom and the cosmos are same. This is something for always yogic science has been saying, and Pindanda are same, it is just Complexity and sophistication is multiplying but essentially it's the same. So if you understand the geometry of how the human system is made, by inference you almost know everything in the existence because everything is geometrically aligned with this. So uh, what do you think is the relevance of yoga in… Oh, you left cinema so easily <laughs> See, <laughs> I thought you were… you do not watch uh, movies. I'd like to know who your favorite actors are. Oh, I was… <laughs> uh, uh, oh, Gregory Peck, oh. long oh. time ago. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart, <laughs> but they're all dead. <laughs> so, I was uh, in conversation with Shubhas Guy. Unfortunately, I had not seen any of his movies. I'm sorry, I have not seen any of the Malayalam movies either. 
So, uh, as we were talking, it's a large group of people and suddenly asked, Sadhguru, tell us uh, which film actress were you in love with when you were a young man? <laughs> I said, uh, well, there were enough local girls, I didn't have to look to Mumbai <laughs> to fall in love with somebody <laughs> Mysore was good. You, can I so, go to the next yes, question? Yeah, okay. So you have spoken in so many platforms all over the world. So is there a, any particular experience or a stage that you… Uh, that's your favorite or you'd like to remember always? Oh. When I simply sit, when I do nothing, I am at my best. People around me know this. When I simply sit, that is the most powerful moment. Talking is just to get them out of their mess and get them into my mess a little bit, <laughs> okay? Because they don't understand any other language. But once I have their attention, all our advanced programs are in total silence and they are the most powerful. So because you watch all these videos and stuff and whatever, the social media and everything, don't think I'm always talking, most of the time I'm not speaking. And uh, please allow me to ask one more question before I conclude my part in this beautiful conversation. Uh, how would you tell me about your life in one sentence? Oh. I thought I'll… How are you saying somewhere that you are someone who has… you are just someone who has figured out what life is all about. That was a beautiful way of putting it, I really liked it. So I just wanted to hear from you, is there any other way you can… You, you want it in one sentence. Would be nice. Huh? <laughs> uh, I thought I lived a little more complex and sophisticated life than one sentence, so I'll take a few <laughs> sentences. <laughs> <laughs> See, who I am right now stems not from an aspiration or an ambition or even a desire. It is the only thing, the only and only thing that I truly know is just that I know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate. It's very… I cannot articulate further than that. You said I'm a wordsmith, I'm not. I'm quite dumbstruck when it comes to my experience. It's only around it I can talk about. But I know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate. Because I know this and when I see every life is made the same way with uh, small… they think they're different, <laughs> okay? Thank you very so, much. So, because of this by inference, when I speak, people think I know everything. This is how people, you know, in universities, big uh, universities in the United States, they're introducing, this is a man who can answer any question for you. I keep reminding them there's only one thing, I know this piece of life, that's all.